Much more uh, familiar to many people is the uh, extraordinary discovery in the 1970s and 1980s of the pattern of violence between neighboring groups of chimpanzees. So starting in January 1974, we had these kills in which a small party of males from one community um, were able to find a male from a neighboring community and savagely uh, beat them to the point where either uh, in the case of Gom, much more uh, familiar to many people is the uh, extraordinary discovery in the 1970s and 1980s of the pattern of violence between neighboring groups of chimpanzees. So starting in January 1974, we had these kills in which a small party of males from one community um, were able to find a male from a neighboring community and savagely uh, beat them to the point where either uh, in the case of Gombe they uh, survived for uh, a few hours or days or in other places they were killed on the spot. These sometimes involved deep incursions into the neighboring territories uh, and uh, sometimes they involved just chance meetings. And what was remarkable in the case of Gombe and Mahali was that in each case within uh, 20 years of their starting their studies uh, one of the communities that they'd had under observation went extinct, suspected to do so largely because of these killings. The phenomenon that has emerged as uh, the studies have spread wider, and I suspect that John Mitani will be speaking more about this this afternoon, is that uh, the attackers have never been seriously damaged. Here is an example from a male that was killed by the chimpanzees that I study. Uh, he was uh, caught on the northern edge of our range. He had uh, cuts all over the ventral side of his body. His thorax had been torn out. One testicle at this stage was lying under his back and another one was about five meters away. The only slight area of the body on the dorsal side that was ripped at all was where another male, one of the attackers, had put his teeth on a bit of skin and uh, ripped it uh, so that the skin came from around the elbow and just uh, tore at the back. I mention these gruesome things just in order to emphasize the fact that they were able to Im impose this absurd and ridiculous and extraordinary horrendous punishment and yet none of them got a scratch. And that is the effect of the power of numbers. And chimps are smart, they only attack when there is this massive imbalance of power. This has led to the development of a hypothesis to explain this behavior. It is the imbalance of power hypothesis, and it begins <coughs> in the ecology of the chimpanzees, which Lynn Isbell will be talking about later, the socio-ecological principles. Restricted as they are to a diet of ripe fruit that they must eat all year, supplemented by some leaves and other foliage, <coughs> chimpanzees are very vulnerable to variation in the amount of fruit in the habitat. And when there is not much, then they tend to go into smaller parties so that each individual can get enough fruit to eat. This means that they have a fission fusion grouping system in which sometimes the parties are large and sometimes they are small. The effect of this is that occasionally you can have these imbalances of power. It may be that in one community, they're forced by ecological circumstance to travel alone, and in the other, the uh, food is enough that they can be in large parties. So imbalances of power arise, parties can meet each other, and this creates a low-cost lethal aggression. This leads to, in the long run, dominance by the ones who are able to make the kill. And the reason is that from time to time, as Toshi described last night, Whole communities may challenge each other over areas of food, and the one that has more males tends to win. So if they have reduced the number of males in the rivals, then they are able to win those battles more often. They're not battles in which anybody gets hurt. They're ones in which there's shouting and screaming and some retreat. But uh, it means that they can get ac access to extra land, as Anne Pusey and her colleagues have shown. And this leads, in the end, to increased biological fitness. Now, this hypothesis is standing up extremely well from different study sites. Let me mention about humans then. Humans in um, 
primitive societies have a form of warfare that in many ways recalls what we see with the chimpanzees. Here is a description of the fighting style of Andaman Islanders, who were the people who have been seen where they were surrounded by other hunters fighting in the same way as they were at the time that anthropological uh, accounts were made. And it's very chimp-like. The whole art of fighting was to come upon your enemies by surprise, uh, then retreat. Uh, they wouldn't venture to attack unless they were certain of taking it by surprise, any serious resistance, and they'd run away. This is the kind of warfare that people regard as unfair and uh, disrespectful and inappropriate, and it's the kind of warfare that looks as if it is in our evolutionary past. And it's the kind of warfare that fits very much the imbalance of power hypothesis, because, again, ecology is seen to be responsible for the fission fusion grouping. And uh, again, fission fusion grouping allows imbalances of power, which again leads to this low cost lethal aggression. Other things do too, taking it by surprise, but <clears throat> these are central. And again, it leads to intergroup dominance and increased access to resources. The significance of this is not that it is a complete account for humans. On the right, you see various ways in which human war is complicated compared to chimpanzee intergroup aggression. And I won't go through those now, except to note that reward and punishment, rewards for men who come back having killed members of the enemy, mean that humans are expected to take greater risks. But the significance of this is that until the chimpanzee data came along, you had very little idea that biology underlay war, and you had all sorts of other ideas. But these ideas now do not look right. You don't need any of these things. What you need is fission fusion grouping and a community organization which gives them a territory. And we can now look at other animals, such as wolves and lions, hyenas and so on, and see they have fission fusion communities and they have similar sorts of attacks on the neighbors. So I think this is a case where the chimpanzee studies are helping to inform our approaches. Now, people think it's very gloomy to talk about this stuff, but it's important because we really do need to understand it. And the human sciences have not gone very far with doing it. For instance, apart from war, what about urban gangs? There's a very weak sociological theory about urban gangs. People dispute. Maybe we can use the chimpanzee studies to help understand those. I like the fact that people like Jane, who have taken on board the significance of this, she writes about it very sensitively, and uh, as a result, she turns her understanding into messages of peace. And so have other people who have been in a position to understand the significance of these data. David Hamburg, with an extraordinarily distinguished record, trying to bring peace to the world. Robert Hind, chair of the British Pugwash Group, trying to remove nuclear weapons, using the fact that chimpanzee violence can help us to have insights into the evolution of our own violence. I've said three things. If we're challenged to think about what chimpanzees tell us, I can't resist just mentioning the fact that in showing that socioecology matters, in showing that food affects behavior, whether you're talking about the behavior of chimpanzees from one season to another, or differences between sites, or differences between species such as gorillas and chimpanzees, as primatologists, we see all sorts of ways in which the food matters enormously. So is that true for humans compared to chimps? Absolutely, I think it is. Because once we cook, everything changes. We get tremendous amounts of energy from cooking, and we have little piles of food that we end up going to have social relationships guided around. I think that in order to understand human evolution, we ultimately need to understand the multiple, multiple impacts of cooking. But that's another story. It's one that comes to me from having wandered around in chimpanzee forests, trying to eat chimpanzee foods, and realizing what a very poor job I would do of surviving uh, when uh, forced to do that. For the moment, I think, <laughs> we can resort to other kinds of, of lessons.